Are you delighted or dismayed at the news that we're broadcasting this morning that Third Energy say they could finally start drilling operations for uh, shale gas at the Kirby, in the Kirby Misperton area in the first half of next year? Look at the furore that it uh, created that was happening around Kirby Misperton uh, when Third Energy were active there just a matter of months ago. An enormous policing operation that's cost North Yorkshire a great deal of money. But, uh, well, today we're reporting that Third Energy say that that drilling process could finally start in the first half of 2019. And I'd just like to know, are you delighted at the decision? Do you want to get it underway, get to this useful source of energy, or are you dismayed? Do you side with those people who've got all sorts of environmental and other objections? On the programme this morning, we're lucky enough to have the uh, the company the company of the Shale Gas Commissioner, who is uh, Natasha Engel. We'll be hearing from her live on the show in a few minutes. So if you've got issues that you want to raise, you want to put, I'm sure she'll be very interested to hear what you have to say, but you have to get in touch to do it. The number to call, as I say, is 0800 treble 1 48 49. Free phone 0800 treble 1 48 49. Text the word York followed by your message to 81333. Texts are charged at your standard message rate. See our privacy notice at bbc.co.uk slash local radio privacy. BBC. BBC Radio York. And be quick to the phone because I think they're going to be busy this morning. So, <clears throat> as you've heard in the news, fracking could start in the county in the first half of next year. That is according to Alan Lynn. Mr. Lynn is the chief operating officer for Third Energy, which, as we know, wants to drill for shale gas at its site at Kirby Misperton near Pickering. He was speaking to BBC Radio York after a public meeting in Moulton last night. Here's a little of what he said. We are paused at the moment. Um, We've got all of our technical plans approved and we're working through the financial resilience process with the government at the moment. Um, it's taken a bit longer than we had anticipated, but we expect to be through that and hopefully back on site early next year. Hopefully back on site early next year. So as we heard, Third Energy's plans to frack at Kirby Misperton are delayed while the company works to meet the government's financial resilience assessment. But Third Energy have definitely not gone away and they say they hope to start drilling in the first half of next year. So fracking back on the agenda. Are you delighted or are you dismayed? 0800 treble 1 48 49. That's what we're talking about uh, between now and 10 o'clock this morning. The government says... Shale gas has the potential to provide the UK with greater energy security, economic growth and jobs and could be an important part of our transition to a low carbon future. Agree or disagree? You please tell me. Um, so, great news that fracking looks like it's going ahead in the first half of next year, or is it? You tell me. 0800 treble 1 48 49. Let's hear a little more from uh, Third Energy's Chief Operating Officer, Alan Lynn, explaining why it's taking them so long to do this business of meeting the government's assessment over the company's finances. It's just to do with the, the way that we're um, sort of funded at the moment. We're in the process of going through a refunding. The nature of our business is that, that it takes a while to go through that process. And before we sort of approach government with sort of final paperwork, we need to have that all firmly in place. And these things just take a long time. OK, so it's a, a sort of a temporary blip while they uh, cross the T's, dot the I's and get all the finances sorted out to convince the government that they're, I suppose, fit and financially proper to go ahead and start this big operation. Your response to it. Some in North Yorkshire have supported the idea of fracking in the county, say it'll be marvellous. It will bring jobs, uh, it will bring um, all sorts of things to the county, sort of financial state stability as we be become a, a, an energy producer. And some people think we should be delighted that we have shale gas under the county. Others are extremely worried, as we know from the passion of the protests that took place at Kirby Misperton a matter of a few months back. Your opinion uh, of the news that they hope to be drilling for shale gas within the start uh, the start of 2019 and as i say natasha engel um who is the shale gas commissioner is going to be live with us in the studio on the program in about 15 minutes time to uh, hear what you have to say and take your feedback so why not give her a call now they did it rather well didn't they wham and wake me up 
before you go go so an opportunity in a few minutes to uh, hear more extensively from natasha engel who is the shale gas commissioner uh, former mp labor mp for uh, north derbyshire she'll be live with us on the program in around about 10 minutes time so if there is a point that you want the shale gas commissioner to hear about how you feel about the prospect of uh, drilling for shale gas here, here in north yorkshire then you know the process of fracking and now's the time to pick up the phone or pass the word to those who are passionate about it either pro or anti be good to hear both sides of the uh, the conversation this morning lorraine is on the line from alliston which is near pickering good morning lorraine Good morning, Jonathan. Nice to be speaking to you this morning. Dismayed, or do I need to ask you, because you've been a voluble uh, presence in the whole debate, delighted or dismayed to well, learn I'm that third, third Energy are back? Yeah, I'm delighted about that, naturally, because I am in favour of shale gas for many reasons, um, because we really do need, as we're going into Brexit, to be able to provide our own energy. Yeah, we've got to cross to renewable, but it's going to take some time and the wind and the sun don't happen all the time, so you need to back them up and gas is perfect. And why would you want to import all the gas that we are importing now, which is almost 50% of what we use, and that's set to rise to sort of like 80% within a few years' time, when we've got it under our feet? Environmentally, that is much better to bring it up from under our feet and use that gas. And it will also then create jobs business opportunities and tax revenue for our government who needs the money to fund all the public services that we all expect and want to be able to enjoy. And what do you say to that um, large number of people, and you've heard these arguments many times before as an advocate of uh, shale gas, of the fracking process, the people who say, we're worried, we really do not know what the environmental consequences of the fracking process will be, and we've heard some pretty awful horror stories from other parts of the world where it happens. Well, you can Google fracking and you can come up with many horror stories, but anybody can put anything online. You've got to be sensible about this, and people, yes, are concerned, and I appreciate that. I fully do. But there's a lot of horror stories that are just myths. I mean, I saw a little video after the debate last night, and this man was saying, it's killing people in other countries. It hasn't killed one person. He says they use formaldehyde in the fracking fluid. No, they don't. They're not allowed to use toxic chemicals. You know, somebody else said they can't get rid of the radi- radioactive waste from the water. Yes, they can. I know they can. I've been and visited the plant to find out exactly how they do the process. And they can get rid of the radioactive waste. You've got to remember, if you stand next to a um, a lorry full of fracking w- fluid waste you would get for two hours you would get the equivalent of one banana's worth of radioactive so are all these people who Can will who will who will that? hang on a minute who are all well, the- i just wanted to finish about the radioactive because if you fly in a plane to spain you're up against 120 bananas worth of radioactive. <laughs> i didn't <laughs> you know I, <laughs> <what's> <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know radioactivity was mentioned was measured in bananas but i stand corrected <laughs> on that so yeah. all these people lorraine um around north yorkshire and from beyond that will tell us with as much conviction as much passion apparently as much knowledge as you have pro fracking they will tell us all the reasons why it's a darn bad idea to go ahead with it are they all making it up have they been misled are they talking through their hats are they lying what's going on there is a lot of misinformation out there there has been a lot of lying one thing i am very against is the ngos like friends of the earth and things. some of their campaigners are paid the average wage they earn is forty thousand pounds a year now that's a stunning wage for this area and they're telling us that we shouldn't have jobs you know, we shouldn't have employment and prospects and opportunity. But they're all well paid. And remember, they campaign and they brought out a leaflet to Friends of the Earth that misled people right in the early days about health issues, that house prices would plummet, um, and, you know, people would get asthma. And all sorts. They said all sorts. they had to withdraw that because they couldn't substantiate those claims. So, yes, there has been a lot of misinformation. We've got to be pragmatic about it. You know, what do we want to do as a country? Do we want to sit in the dark? Do we want to import it from all other countries? Or do we actually want to produce our own gas safely and environmentally friendly? It can be done. Lorraine, we'll leave it there. Thank you very much indeed. Lorraine, who is um, a, a very voluble, passionate and apparently extremely well-informed voice. 
pro-fracking. You've heard her arguments this morning. She's put it very elegantly in a nutshell for us. Do you disagree with her or do you back her up in what she says? It's about jobs. It's about en energy sustainability. All sorts of things. And she's passionately in favour of it. Um, are you delighted that fracking is coming back to North Yorkshire or are you dismayed like those many who protested? Let's hear more from something that Lorraine just referred to then, uh, that public meeting over fracking that took place last night. More than 200 people packed at a hall in Malton to discuss the government's proposals to take decision-making on fracking applications away from local people, from local councils. BBC Radio York's Mike Kemp was there for us. Welcome to Malton. The heart of the Yorkshire Sacrifice Zone. So said the town's mayor, Paul Andrews, as he warned of a proliferation of fracking wells in the Rydale countryside. Builders a debate about government proposals to take decision-making on fracking applications away from local councils. This public meeting was more than just that. It was a wide-ranging criticism of fracking in general and its perceived threat to climate change. Are we really going to allow the democracy to be hijacked by the fossil fuel industry and have all the decisions taken in London. Frank Colenso, described as a Rydell community campaigner, one of the main speakers at the event. The audience was mostly on his side. Among the 200 people were many familiar faces from the recent anti-fracking protests in Kirby Mispeton. A lot asked the same question. Is this government really listening? Because we have now had how many surveys on um, fracking? About five. And every result has been opposed and the government has pressed on regardless. So you can understand how people here are sceptical. Kevin Hollinrake, the Conservative MP for Thirsk and Moulton, told them he was listening. He's a supporter of fracking for shale gas as long as it's properly regulated. Even he won applause when he said he opposed government plans to wrest fracking applications from local councils. If the government pushes ahead with permitted development and NSIP without the controls and guidelines, I will absolutely oppose it. And the government will oppose it. In the audience was one man who supported what the government was trying to do. He was Alan Lynn, the Chief Operating Officer at Third Energy, which has permission to frack at Kirby Mispeton near Pickering, though those plans are stalled while they work to meet the government's financial resilience assessment. When he stood up to boos and hissing, he argued that the government proposals didn't mean that getting permission to drill a fracking well would be as easy as asking to put up a garden shed, as some campaigners claim. Does a garden shed need an environmental application and an environmental oh, permit? Does it need an oil and gas authority approval? Does it need Bayes to approve it? Does it need the HSE to approve it? Listening to the debate was former MP Natasha Engel, who's just been appointed as Commissioner for Shale Gas. She's to act as a link between the shale gas industry, the local communities and regulators. It's not going to be an easy ride. You thought I was working for the government. I'm a government appointment, but I'm completely independent of government. Um, what I'm not, what I'm not is impartial. I'm not impartial. I do support um, the exploration of shale gas as a way of helping us to reach our climate change targets. And I think that is... The meeting ended more than two hours later with the chairman, landowner Ken Elm Story, summing up the general mood. What we want is a joined up energy policy concentrating on renewables over fossil fuels and we would like to see that implemented through the existing local planning system. Mike Kemp reporting from that public meeting in Malton last night. How do you feel about it? Delighted or dismayed that the prospects of uh, fracking for shale gas is back on the agenda? Third Energy say they hope to be doing it in the first part of next year, 2019. Uh, Natasha Engel is with us. She is the uh, shale gas commissioner. Uh, you can put your questions to her. You can make your point. She's listening. Um, and she'll be live on air with me in around about five minutes' time. The number to call is 0800 treble 4849 Let's hear what Sue, though, has to say on the line from Aiken. We heard from Lorraine a few minutes ago, who is passionately in favour of uh, fracking getting underway in North Yorkshire. I have a feeling that Sue thinks differently. Good morning, Sue. Good morning, Jonathan. So far away, delighted or dismayed about fracking coming? Uh, I just lose heart, Jonathan. I really do. Um, especially, you know, when we know about climate change. We really should not be going down this path at all. Why not? It's a fossil fuel. You know, I mean, the dangers, you know, themselves with fracking 
I'm sorry, but I have to disagree with Lorraine entirely. They don't he even have to declare what chemicals they are using in the fracking liquid. And if the liquid waste is so safe, why did David Cameron bring a law in the Infrastructure Act that allows them to bury it into deep, deep um, tunnels underneath people's land? You tell me that, but um, Lorraine tells me it's absolutely fine. There's nothing dangerous in there. There's no formaldehyde, which is something that people have said. It doesn't contain any radioactivity, no more radioactivity than in a banana, she says. I think she's living in Cloud Cuckoo Land, Jonathan. Um, This is what's so difficult for me because here I sit on the fence between two sides of uh, uh, apparently equally well-informed people. I know that, you know, you've studied the subject and the environment and and what have you, and that you have facts and figures at your fingertips. So does Lorraine. And you both pull the rest of us in different directions, apparently presenting cases that are equally valid. And the rest of us are left sitting in the middle thinking, who is actually telling me the truth? Not that somebody, not that one side is deliberately lying, but that whose facts are right. The science doesn't lie, Jonathan. And the, the sad thing is, if it goes ahead and God forbid something does go wrong, you cannot, you cannot put the genie back in the bottle. Once those chemicals get into the aquifer, beneath the ground, that's it. Your drinking water's gone. And is it really worth that risk? Because I don't think it is. Lorraine, Lorraine tells us, you know, jobs, economic security, um, government revenue, all sorts of things. The real positives here. Um, I think I'm taken back to what was said by, uh, I think he was the last Cheyenne chief, uh, Wolf Robb. I can't remember the exact word in Jonathan, but it was basically something like only when, when the last tree has been felled, the last fish has been taken, the last river been poisoned, will man realise he can't eat money? That's a very stark and it's a, a very powerful image. Thank you for sharing that this morning. Thank and you, Jonathan. Sue, thank you very much indeed for sharing your opinions. Karen is on the line there. Karen Garrett, who's a parish councillor for Great and Little Bath. Um, and I understand that you were at the meeting last night. Oh, good morning, Jonathan. Yes, I was. Um, and... I have to say that um, the speakers, Andy Tickle, Nick Howard, Frank Lenso, Paul Andrews, um, did a very good job of um, explaining um, the reasons why permitted development, which is what the talk was um, about, shouldn't go ahead, the various different reasons. And one thing that stood out was, um, uh, from all of them really, was, was the impact on climate change. And obviously, with the news last week that you know we're we're on a bit of a roller coaster ride towards um, you know the, the temperatures rising faster than um, than previously thought. The, these were the announcements in South Korea from these senior climate scientists. Absolutely. And you know, yet, of course, there are people who entirely dispute that. They throw back. I mean, I had emails <laughs> after the program saying, "How dare you give exposure to this report? Where's the balance in this?" And you know, my response to that is quite simple: when an equally um, heavyweight group of scientists comes up with a report that says climate change is nonsense, we'll discuss that and give that exposure too. Well, ab- absolutely. But I mean, what what came came what what Kevin and Natasha both stated last night was, um, you know, obviously they're looking at at fracking as a bridge to, um, you know, renewable energy in the future. Now, um, if we had homegrown grass, homegrown gas, not grass, um, that we wouldn't need to import gas. Now, um, you're not telling me that they wouldn't be turning the taps off from the sources where we currently get our gas from now, you know, i.e. Norway or wherever. Um, so therefore, wouldn't we be adding to the problem rather than actually reducing the problem? Because you know, it's uh, gas exploration elsewhere is not going to stop overnight just because we're not buying it. Karen, can I just ask you? Did you get to speak personally to the Commissioner for Shale Gas, Natasha Engel, last night? 
I didn't personally. Would you like no. to? Because she's sitting. Would, a, she's sitting I opposite. Would like to. She's yeah, sitting opposite me so. in the studio this morning. Good morning. Welcome to the studio. Hello. Thank you very no, much. For nice to meet me. you. This is the voice of Natasha Engel, the Commissioner for Shale Gas. Karen, um, fire away because um, um, Natasha's been listening to some of what you've said already. What do you have a question or a particular point that you want to make to her? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the one on climate change is is a huge, you know, is a huge issue. Um, I mean, obviously, we've been involved with with the uh, the potential for, for fracking for the last four years now, and we've learned an awful lot in a very short space of time. Some people say that we, you know, we we haven't got the the grasp on it, but you know, I firmly believe that um, you know the local residents, and you've seen for yourself the way the people spoke last night that were on the stage. Um, that we are, you know, well educated, informed individuals. So therefore. You know, our opinion should be, um, you know, taken. And your seriously. opinion is what? The commissioner um, is listening. Your opinion, and you think local belief is what? The local belief is that fracking is not the bridge to renewable energy that the government make it out to be. I mean, let's face it, we're four years down the line with third energy here. They haven't fracked yet, um, despite Alan Lynn's um, interview earlier. Um, you know, it's it, everything has always been kind of a stay of execution. It's been, and now they're waiting for the um, uh, financial resilience test. And then so, you, in, in essence, in essence, you don't, we're, want, we're, it, you don't want it. You don't want. You don't want it to go ahead. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, and I mean, at the end of the day, if we've got another twelve years before you know reaching these temperatures, why extract another fossil fuel and? You know, and, and because it's taken so long for Quadrilla to get to this position and Third Energy to get to this position, how on earth is fracking going to be um, the bridge to renewable energy, considering the cumulative amount of time it's taken to actually get to the point where they might actually drill one well, considering the proliferation that is required to actually make this industry viable in the UK. Karen Garrett, thank you very much indeed for your question. Well, and Natasha Engel, the Commissioner for Shale Gas, good morning. Good morning. Is with us this morning. She's heard your question. Um, how come shale gas is, you know, it's, it's all moved very slowly. Is it possibly a, a bridge to some kind of world of renewable energy? And isn't it just another fossil fuel that is going to fly in the face of the findings of the other week, um, this uh, international uh, climate change uh, warning that the planet is warming up too much we just shouldn't be taking this stuff out of the ground and burning it yeah um and hi karen and uh, you you raised really a lot of really important issues that they did get raised last night um i just wish they'd been raised in the way that you've raised them karen because um actually what you've said is you know is very reasonable and i think what would have been nicer last night would have been if we had had that debate about how do we reach those climate change targets i think one for me one of the really important issues is that the renewable that the total amount of renewable energy that we use, so this isn't in the generation of electricity, but the total amount of renewable energy that we used last year, only 2.2% came from wind and only 0.5% came from solar. Now, they, those are very, very low numbers. And I think, you know, if we look at the fact that 85% of our houses um, use uh, gas to cook, we over 60% use gas to heat our homes, um, I think you know we are really reliant on gas at the moment is that where this gas is actually going because i've been told umpteen times that actually the gas that's produced the shale gas it's not actually going into anybody's cooker or anything like that it's actually being piped to the plastics industry to help them produce plastics which again people don't want on the face of the planet uh, and and that is a different issue. That's a, that that is um, that that's Ineos who are wanting to get the gas in order to displace the gas that they're importing from America at the moment. So there is also that industrial aspect to it. But just to concentrate on what Karen was saying about climate change for a minute, um, I think that there is an argument to be had about how do we get to a future where we are less carbon emitting. And one of the things that really struck me was, um, and it's an example that I gave last night, Karen, was about if you look at America, where they've in invested massively in both shale and in renewables, their 
carbon emissions have dropped 1% year on year for the last decade. In Germany, where they are closing down their nuclear power stations, they've invested hugely in wind, but they haven't invested in gas and have instead relied on coal-fired power stations when the wind isn't blowing, um, their carbon emissions have increased year on year. And so just that example alone kind of makes me think we really do need to look at gas. But by all means, I mean, I think... Trying to find ways of using fewer fossil fuels is absolutely the way to go. So why, so why start extracting another one? In order to displace the stuff that's coming in. Now, that is also a different argument to be had. Um, if people want to continue importing... Um, importing gas that's still kind of bringing gas into the country it's coming out of the ground from somewhere i just think that if that's what we accept then we should look at doing it safely here in order that we don't spend the tax money on buying it in that we can instead get tax money you know there's huge tax receipts that could build hospitals and schools and jobs in places that need them but i think you can't really look at those benefits until you you know, we all sit down. And as you said, cool. Karen, can, can, just, just just very quickly, okay. last night what was really, really evident was the expertise in the room, was the passion in the room. Um, there was a very dominant point of view. I mean, there weren't very many people there who, who, who supported the idea of getting gas out of the ground domestically. But what was clear was the passion, but also the expertise. OK, let's hear some passion. Len is on the line from Scarborough. Good morning, Len. Good morning. Are you passionate? Not really, no. <laughs> <laughs> are you dismayed? Are you delighted that, at the prospect of shale gas being extracted in the first part of next year? Well, quite frankly, I don't pretend to be an expert on fracking. I never have been, and I won't, and I'm not. But what I am bothered about is the water table. Can the fracking companies give an unconditional guarantee that the water table will not be contaminated? It's a fair enough and very simple question, Commissioner. Um, I, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the industry. Um, and all, all that the regulators say is that they have got the best regulations in the world. They are the, the tightest regulations and that they want to make sure that the chances of anything like that happening um, are kept to the absolute minimum. Now, I, uh, having spoken to, the, it's the Environment Agency that looks after after the water. Um, there are very, very strict rules about where people can put boreholes and where they can't put them in order to exactly avoid water contamination. I know that that's something that people are really concerned about. It's certainly something we've seen an awful lot from the United States, you know, the video pictures of people being able to light the water that comes out of their tap and they say that's because it is contaminated, full of highly combustible shale gas and maybe other things as well. And it's it's a very vivid illustration and people say, well, you know, for one thing, we don't want that here, thank you. And, and they're great pictures, And but all of those pictures that, that we've seen where people set their taps on fire um, in America, they tend to have far more boreholes in their in their back gardens than we do in the UK. Most of us are on water mains. Um, and when you've got boreholes going down through pockets of methane, um, that then contaminates the water. But none of those examples has actually been one where it has anything to do with fracking. Len, are you convinced by what the Commissioner says there? Well, no, because the simple answer is no. They can't give a guarantee that the, will, the water table will not be contaminated. Regulation, no matter how stringently imposed, does not guarantee. No, exactly. I mean, you know, there are stringent regulations that, I don't know, stop air crashes, but we still have air crashes. And, and is it worth the risk of polluting the natural environment of a beautiful county like North Yorkshire? Even, you know, with the toughest regulations in the world, something can go wrong and we're left with that as a lasting legacy. And we, you know, people in the county say we don't want it. But it, but it oh, sorry. Sorry, go on. Sorry, I say we drink the stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. And and I want to I want to absolutely emphasise that it's got to be done safely. And if it's not done safely, I don't want it to happen. But if but it isn't, it's too late. But your example of. Um, of flying, um, everybody knows that if they go into an aeroplane, that um, that it, you, they take a risk. Um, but most people think that the aeroplanes are safe, that there are regulations in place. There are very few aeroplanes that actually do drop out of the sky, um, and we do it because we want to go on holiday now, or, or we need to travel for business or whatever. But we want to get from A to B. But we take that choice. And the issue here is, it's exactly the same. Is that if we want to keep our homes warm, and if we want to, you know. Cook with gas if we want to you know 
live the lifestyle that we lead. You know, most of the clothes that both of us are wearing are made fundamentally with, uh, with you know, molecules derived from gas. Um, and if we want to build wind turbines, you know, we can't do it without plastic. We can't do it without steel. And you can't make steel without coal. And, you know, solar panels, you can't make those without gas. You can't make them without carbon fibres. These are choices. Where are we going to get that gas from? And that's the conversation that we really ought to be happening. Len, Len, thank you very much indeed for your question. Let's move on. Uh, Dr Tim Thornton is with us on the line. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Jonathan. What's the question that you would like to put to uh, the Commissioner for Shale Gas, Natasha Engel? Uh, well, I'm concerned that, that we're moving away from experts and uh, professionals and going towards opinion and hope. Um, and in fact, in the planning, National Planning Policy Framework, they removed the need to look at sound science responsibly. And in the planning process for an application for fracking, public health does not occur as a material consideration. So we've removed science, we've removed public health. But the experts, if you ask the experts, as I have done, and I have read extensively what the experts are telling us, there are significant risks and actual harms demonstrated from fracking. <clears throat> Such as what? Give us, a br- are, give us a brief example, would you? Well, uh, the, um, the past president of the Faculty of Public Health has said he's very much against fracking. And the current president, uh, president of the Faculty of Public Health is equally opposed, both on public health grounds and on climate change grounds. Natasha Engel, there we are. I've got uh, uh, pr- uh, Dr Thornton quoting two very senior people in the world of public health saying they oppose fracking on public health grounds. And and, uh, and Tim, I mean, we, we, we know each other, and uh, Tim is a very um, passionate campaigner against fracking. Um, I think that there is a lot of information out there, and I think the information against fracking um, by campaigners has been really dominant. And I think that's the, that, that those are the conversations that are being had, the conversations that are not being had are what the advantages are and whether it can be done safely where it has been done safely where we can learn from where it has been done safely and I I would just say that you know we have got very dominant voices in this debate that are very against fracking and they tend to be from not not surprisingly and I you know totally understand it by those people who live closest to those sites they are going to be most heavily impacted by it and so of course they're going to be very passionate about it but I still think that there's room for a debate to widen that debate out a little bit and look at it uh, you know, in a in a much much wider context, so that those people who wouldn't turn up to the meeting last night, uh, you know, if, if I was a neutral person who wanted to know a bit about fracking, I would not have gone to that meeting last night because that was, you know, only about being against fracking and how to stop it. To get that information out there, that sort of adds a little bit more to the debate than what we have at the moment. So, are you? Can I just, Tim? Thank you very much indeed for your call. Um, are you then, as the shale gas? the commissioner for shale gas are you entirely neutral because listening to you it might sound to some people like you are in some ways an apologist for something that tens of thousands of people are either worried about or actively oppose i'm I'm certainly no apologist and and i'm absolutely not neutral no i'm not i'm I'm independent from government i am i uh, i'm independent from the from the industry um i really want to talk to and listen to local residents and make sure that they're their concerns are raised and their their voices are heard. But I'm I'm not impartial in the same way that all those people in the room, as Dr. Tim Thornton as well, um, are also not impartial. We have a point of view, and I think it's important that a different point of view is also heard in this debate. And I don't think it is at the moment. It's all it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, I know you're a former Northern Labour MP. You're the MP for former MP for North East Derbyshire. Yes. Very odd, some people say, that all this fracking business is happening in what, I can't remember the precise words that we use, but, you know, the far desolate north, well away from the comfortable, wealthy home counties, well away from, uh, you know, the the, the sort of uh, the, the soft south. Well, we can do it in the north. It can all happen there. Is that just because of geology or is that simply because um, there are people in the south of England, the decision makers, who know that votes in their constituencies rest on not having fracking wells there and therefore it can happen in the north as far as they're concerned? Well, it, it is geology, obviously, that they can only go where they think that the that they're going to find the gas. It is also happening in Sussex. Um, there's there's, there's uh, oil and gas down there. 
So it's not just in the north. But I think actually if you look at exactly those places in the north where they are exploring, they are some of those communities that are ex-coal mining like my old constituency in North East Derbyshire, North Nottinghamshire, Rother Valley, Lancashire also, or Lancashire is already quite industrialised. But actually those are the areas where after coal mining, after sort of former industrial areas that are desperate for jobs, desperate for an industry. And I think that sort of, you know, rather Rather than say it's it's kind of the south imposing something on the north, this is something that is giving us a real opportunity. Okay, let's hear final caller. It'll have to be uh, Philip, who is on the line from Butterwick near Kirby Misperton. Good morning, Philip. Yeah, um, good morning, Jonathan. I think I just wanted to talk briefly about the description of shale gas as a bridging fuel. Now, the, the point to bear in mind is that the fracking industry business model depends upon demand for gas remaining high. The industry has no interest at all in cooperating with a programme to reduce gas consumption. And it would be possible to think of shale gas as a bridging fuel, never mind all the environmental damage that it will do. It would be possible to think of it as a bridging fuel if we had a serious programme to reduce our dependency upon fossil fuels. And we don't. And that is a reason enough to oppose fracking. Commissioner. Um, I, I think the serious program on renewables is absolutely essential, and and I think um, until we've got a sort of a, a, a much stronger narrative around that, and you know one is coming, but I think really we need to be much stronger on renewables in the way that they are in America, investing in renewables at the same time as saying right this is how we're going to phase phase fossil fuels out. I think that's really really important, um, and because only in that context can we really start talking about how do we use gas at that bridge as that bridging fuel and I totally agree with you on that. Philip? Yes, but you know that renewables also have to have a base load because they're intermittent. So the nation has to reduce its dependency, it has to reduce its energy requirement. And that's the program that needs to be at top of the agenda before we start looking at new ways to continue with bad habits. Yeah, absolutely. Use less, but also kind of use it much more efficiently. I think the sort of insulating homes is a really important step in, in doing that. I think, no you know, solar panels on... No well, and there ought to be. And I'm, gonna to have, be. and I'm going to have to stop you both there. Just tell me finally and briefly, if and when, as seems likely, people gather in the Kirby Misperton area to, um, to protest, because that's what happened before, there's no reason to, to think it won't happen again. Um, will you come and talk to those people on the protest line at Kirby Misperton and try and convince them as you've convinced us this morning you've said you're not impartial but will you go will you go and talk to those protesters I, I, as i did yesterday and uh, you know uh, we're never going to agree that these people have got very strong opinions and i absolutely respect those opinions but i'm always happy to talk to anybody okay natasha engel commissioner for shale gas thank you very much indeed <laughs> thank you for so much for inviting me in, un, well unexpectedly being able to join us live on bbc radio york and take people's questions this morning 